Now, let's go back to what I said about ocean strumming. I call it ocean strumming because sometimes it, it makes it easier for you to think about in your head, but if you were to go somewhere, if you don't live near the ocean, I don't live near the ocean, if you go to the ocean and you just sit and watch the waves of an ocean, right? It, it's, it's pretty mesmerizing. Not only what you're seeing, but what you're hearing because it's unpredictable. It's not like it's, you know, a, a sine wave or something like that that's, that's consistent. It's not. The, the, sometimes the waves are big. Sometimes they're little. Sometimes there's a lot of them. Sometimes there's just a few of them. Um, you know, depending on what the wind is doing, sometimes they can be really aggressive and then all of a sudden it'll get calm. And I always think about strumming as kind of being that. So if I was to take, for instance, a G chord and a D chord and a C chord and then back to a G chord. And you can kind of do this with me, okay? If you've got your guitar handy and if you're, if you're at work or something, obviously you can, you can, you know, try this later, but... Um, you know, if you've got your guitar handy and you want to play along with me here, we can certainly do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, I'm going to play G, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, D, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, C, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, G, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? Only we're going to do that a little slower, just so it, it doesn't feel so rushed for you. So I'm going to go... But again, I know I've got upstrums in between those. And again, I could play a strumming pattern. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Sometimes we need strumming patterns to, to fix a, a situation that we find ourselves in or we're just not feeling something and we need a pattern. What I'm saying is this is what you want to work toward and this is what the guitar course is going to focus on is training you to really think about music from the creative perspective, not just, you know, strumming patterns and chord changes, uh, playing kind of by route, if you will. Okay? So let's take that now. I'm going to think one, two, three, four, one, right there. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to try and kind of organic strum. And what I want you to do is sort of turn your brain off and just kind of let the arm move back and forth, like kind of like a maraca, right? It just kind of moves back and forth. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move in and I'm gonna move out, and I'm gonna move in at different points in time, and I'm gonna move out. So I'm not consciously thinking about which downs or ups I'm gonna hit. I'm trying to let my intuition and my availability being able to hear music, and again, this might take time. I don't know, you know, you've gotta try this. But I'm gonna try and let that kind of take over as I play. And don't worry if you're not hearing things. Maybe just the ability of being able to be random might start clicking in your brain and you'll start hearing it going, oh yeah, I kind of get what he's talking about. So you don't have to have it all planned out. It's not like all of us have all of this planned out before we begin. You just learn to feel it as you go. So here we go. One, two, ready, go. Now, if you find when you practice that, that it's really hard for you to do, what you could do is simply avoid the chord changes, just pick one chord and just practice that, okay? Now, what I like about that section thing I was telling you about, about the top, the middle, and the bottom, right, is that if you're on a D chord, for instance, you can use that to your advantage because instead of strumming the whole guitar and hitting some strings you don't want, you just direct your pick toward the middle or the, the bottom, again, the bottom thinking toward the floor here, you kind of direct your pick that way in your mind. So you're not, again, you're not worried about whether you're hitting four strings all the time on a D chord. Obviously, that ideally, that's what you want. But that doesn't always happen for any of us. So you just kind of hit at random places here. Sometimes you hit more than four. Sometimes I hit the fifth string. Heck, sometimes I probably hit the sixth string, right? I'm just not doing this that sounds awful, right? So again, instead of being panicked and thinking you have to hit four strings all the time, you, s you start thinking about the guitar as kind of sections that you can hit different places. Maybe you hit sections middle and bottom together. 
and you're just avoiding the top, so you're kind of breaking the guitar in half, if you will. Top, bottom, and that's okay too. That might help you as well. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do, let me check my notes on my phone. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's say we start developing that. And again, I want you to understand that it, this isn't a, okay, I'm gonna practice this Tuesday and then I'm done, or Thursday or whatever it might be. What I want you to think about is that it's something that you do every day because the more you can develop that strum, I have found the more opportunities I get for doing recordings and performances and things like that because I'm able to keep a really steady... I, I had one, one uh, producer tell me one time that I had the... Um, I, my timing was like ACDC. It was just like a rock. It was solid. And that was one of the nicest compliments I, I ever got because... Um, you know, I take pride in my availability of being able to drive a song um, for people to play along with or to sing along with or whatever it might be. You know, as a guitar player, you're not always driving the song. Sometimes the drummer is. Not all the time, though. I mean, different songs require different things. And um, some songs you let the singer lead, right? Because maybe the song can use some, some tempo changes with that singer and so you're playing in back you're kind of following that singer but in order to do that you've got to be able to listen you can't just be focusing on you know your chord changes in a strumming pattern the whole time and not listen to the musical world that's going on around you you've got to be able to listen and you know and kind of bring that along so never underestimate that and the power that rhythm has. I have a bit of a cold, I'm sorry. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about simple embellishments to your chords to make those a little more exciting, okay? So let's say, for instance, we're, we're going to use the same GCD scenario here. And again, it works for all kinds of different chords. But what I do want to say to you is if you know anything about guitar playing and you've been playing for a while, if you haven't, don't worry about it. But if you have, you know, you know you've got bar chords and things like that. And... Um, Bar chords are great because they fill in the gaps of certain chords that you can't play in the open position. But here's the deal, and certainly on acoustic guitar, this is really powerful. Open chords have a certain sound that bar chords do not. Open chords often referred to as cowboy chords, chords that use open strings. Because they're all different shapes like this, and oftentimes you've got fingers that you're not using, right? So you can learn to add those fingers to get different sounds or subtract fingers you see and you get different sounds when you're playing a bar chord oftentimes all your fingers are being used in some capacity not always I'm just saying that there's a misconception sometimes between open chords and bar chords that you know bar chords are more important than open chords or you know open chords are for beginners and bar chords and none of that is true which brings me to the capo what the cape what's great about the capo is you can take all of your open chords and move it into a different key and still retain the power of those open chords and all of these embellishments that I'm going to be showing you by simply putting the capo on the guitar and then being able to still do all of these kinds of embellishments so you know, when I was growing up, I was always told that the capo was a cheater because you wouldn't have to learn how to play your bar chords. And it always confused me because I'm like, no, I play bar chords when I need bar chords and I use the capo when I need open chords, but I need to do this stuff, right? Uh, let's say I was playing something like um, this. I'll take the G here and I'm going to play this... Um, I wish you were here. So I'm playing Wish You Were Here. And then my singer comes along and maybe my singer oftentimes is my daughter, right? So first of all, she's female, right? So her voice is a little bit higher than, than, um, than the Pink Floyd version would be. So what I would do is go, okay, well, let's go to the second fret here. Okay, let's try that. So now I do the same thing. and I find a key that works for her. 
And that's beneficial for both of us because for me, I'm not revamping the way I play it. I'm playing it the way I always play it. I'm just playing it somewhere else, okay? So there's power in learning how to use the capo and still maintain those open chords and all the stuff that you're learning how to do. It's an entirely different thing than learning how to play bar chords, just so you understand that.